Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. James, chapter 2, starting at verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the faith that you have given us to believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. Apart from your work in our hearts, we would have remained steadfast in our rebellion against you. We would have continued to suppress the truth that there is an all-powerful God of this universe that displays his glory through his creation. It is by your grace that we have been saved through faith in Christ and we thank you that you have called us to such a wonderful salvation. We know that no man has ever or will ever be saved by his own works. We know that your holiness is too pure to be tainted or minimized with our inadequate and unworthy attempts of righteousness. So we do thank you that we were saved and justified by works, but not our works but through the perfect life and works of Jesus, our Savior. Lord, we ask that you would help us help our works to increase as our faith in you is stretched and grown. As we look to you for our strength and hope, help our lives to be demonstrations of greater obedience, of realizing a greater peace in the midst of our circumstances a greater confidence that regardless of the situation, we can walk securely and boldly, knowing that no matter the outcome, that what you have for us is best. Thank you for the evidence of spiritual growth that we see in our lives, evidence that is often displayed through our works. We look to you because we know that it is you who brings the increase. And we look to you because we know that there is much more spiritual growth that needs to take place in our lives for us to be a clear representation of Christ to those around us. Please grow our faith so that we will reflect him more fully and that your name will be praised and that you will receive the glory that you so rightly deserve. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would, turn with me uh, in God's Word to Luke 
chapter 14, Luke chapter 14. And I want to pick up this morning where we left off last week in verse 15. You remember that we are at a dinner. The host is a self-righteous leader of the Pharisees who has orchestrated this dinner as an opportunity to accuse and to condemn Jesus. The guests at this dinner include a number of Pharisees and lawyers or scribes who are there probably as legal witnesses, but certainly to be seen and to be honored by others. Jesus has been invited and he came to their dinner. But the much bigger question that really surfaces in this passage is, will these men be dining in the kingdom at his dinner? He has been invited to their dinner, and he came. They have been invited to his, but will they come? Follow along as I read Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I I need to go out and, and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have found five, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. I guess since the beginning of time, dinners have been a special time when people gather together and enjoy God's goodness and as they are nourished by all that God has provided to sustain our physical bodies. But that gathering is so much more than just food, isn't it? It's also a place where we connect with one another. It's a place where we share our lives. It's a a meaningful time of fellowship with others. We aren't just taking food in to nourish our bodies, but we are taking one another in through our conversation, caring for one another, enjoying one another, listening to one another, sharing life with one another, learning from one another, growing closer to one another. That was a very, very important part of Jewish life. Even outside the daily family gathering, there were large even larger banquets that were a regular part of the Jewish community. Their weddings, for example, were long, drawn-out celebrations, sometimes lasting even a week, filled with banquets, filled with rejoicing. Jewish life was teeming with those kinds of dinners and those kinds of banquets. It was, a, it was a very hard life for most people, a hard agrarian society that demanded a lot of physical work, a lot of hours, and so these dinners and banquets were a welcomed and joyful break from all of that. They were a time of celebration. In fact, we see in Scripture that God ordained certain annual feasts where even as a nation they would be gathered together to remember God and to celebrate His goodness together. together. 
There was the, the Passover of the feast and the feast of unleavened bread, remembering God's delivering them from Egypt. There was Pentecost, the celebration of the first fruits of the harvest. There was the Feast of Tabernacles, remembering their wanderings in the wilderness. Those were national banquets that were full of celebration, full of rest, full of joy, as they remembered and honored their covenant God and all that he had done for them. But the greatest hope that they all had was that one day they would be dining in the kingdom. The greatest of all banquets they were looking forward to was when their Messiah came, when he delivered them from their political and social and economic oppression that they were living under, and they would reestablish Israel as the head and not the tail. At that time of the kingdom, they believed that they would all partake in the greatest of all banquets. And you say, well, where did they get that idea? Well, listen to what Isaiah 25, 6 says. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on his mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of, with marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched out over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe, wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Now that's talking about a time of a, of a lavish kingdom feast, a celebration that the Lord will prepare for all of his people. This feast was really kind of a symbol of the joyful celebration that would continually flow when God's Messiah came and made everything right again. That's what, that's what Israel was looking forward to. That was part of their hope that they would all be dining in the kingdom. We even look forward to that in Revelation 19, uh, where we're told of a marriage supper of, a, of the Lamb. We, we look forward to that time as the church, don't we? The most glorious of all banquets where God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ are honored, where the Holy Spirit is continually empowering that perfect love between us, that perfect fellowship where we are filled to overflowing with continual joy as we fellowship, as we celebrate our King and His kingdom. So this idea of, of, a, of a heavenly banquet was what Israel looked forward to. All these earthly feasts, all these, all these banquets were just a distant taste of that ultimate dining in the kingdom. But the big question was who would come? Now, who, would, who would come to such a, a banquet? That's the question that Jesus is confronting these Pharisees and lawyers with at this particular dinner. The invitation has gone out. The question is who would come? Who would come? And Jesus gives the answer to that question with this story in verses 15 through 24. Now let me back up just a brief moment before we get to the story to remind you of our context here. It began back in verse 1. Remember we are at a dinner and before the dinner even got started, Jesus had healed a man with palsy. We saw that in verses 1 through 6. This whole thing, as we know, was a setup by the, by the Pharisees on the Sabbath to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. That was an offense that was punishable by death, according to Exodus 31. But they had perverted the law. They had made up restrictions that were unbiblical, imposed them upon the people, and were now trying to trap Jesus with their traditions. Of course, Jesus heals the man, and in the process, he rebukes these leaders of Israel for their lack of love, their lack of compassion, and then he sends the man away. And, and as he does, he turns to see these Pharisees, these lawyers, scrambling like rats to get the seats of honor. 
And so in verses 7 through 11, he confronts their pride and he calls them to humility. He calls them to a, a biblical truth that they should have all known. A truth that we find throughout Scripture by not only example, but by precept as well. That the one who humbles himself will be exalted, and the one who exalts himself will be humbled. And then in verses 12 through 14, he addresses the host on the same issue of pride. The, the implications for, for both of these are those who are prideful will be rebuked this is what it is it was a rebuke that humility comes before exaltation if they wanted to be in the kingdom they were going to have to humble themselves before god they were going to have to repent the question is will they do that i mean the invitation to the kingdom has gone out to the banquet Jesus said on the Sermon of the Mount, Blessed are, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom, we understand, as Jesus taught, belongs to the humble. Those who are poor in spirit understand their spiritual poverty. The humble confess themselves as sinners before God and look to Him alone to save them from their sin, to extend that mercy, to extend forgiveness, to lift them up in His righteousness because they recognize they don't have a righteousness of their own. So if they want to enjoy the, the greatest of, of all banquets, will they do that? Will, will they humble themselves before God? Will they be dining at the kingdom? The Pharisees believed they would be dining there because they kept their traditions, because they were Jews of the seed of Abraham. Their confidence was in their own works and in their pedigree. They weren't humble at all. In fact, they thought that they would be the ones sitting in the most prominent places in that kingdom banquet. They felt that because of their works, they were not only deserving to be there, but also deserving of those most honored places at the dinner. So maybe to press that upon Jesus after his rather scathing lecture on humility that they had just heard, verse 15 says, When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. At this point, Jesus is reclining at the table with these guys. And I think that after that scuffle for the places of, the, uh, of honor, it's safe to say that Jesus was in that very last place. And one of the men there reclining at the table with him says in response to his call to humility, he says to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And that statement appears to be a, a big exclamation point that they all will be dining in the kingdom. It might have, it might have even been kind of a, a toast. And if, if these other guys were listening in and they heard this, uh, I'm sure there would have been a lot of amens, amen, amen. Well, you would have heard that from everybody except Jesus. And so with this story that follows, Jesus is trying to destroy any false hope they might have that they will be there unless they repent, unless they humble themselves. And that's what this story is all about. From the evidence of their hatred for him, from the evidence of their lack of love and lack of compassion, and on the evidence of their pride, Jesus tells this story to destroy their false confidence that they are going to be dining in the kingdom. If they're going to be there, any, if there is any hope of being there, if there's any hope for true repentance, they're going to have to hear the bad news first. And that's what this story does. It confronts it confronts their lost condition. It exposes it. Man is, is so easily deceived in believing that we are basically good and basically do good things that make us deserving of, of heaven, deserving of God's favor. That's the default of fallen man. And that's why false religions are so, so effective in the world. 
And so when we are inviting people to the kingdom like Jesus does here, we need to help them see where they truly are. We need, we need to, to expose their true relationship to God. And that's what this story Jesus tells here does for these Pharisees. Now I want to give you kind of some pegs to hang this story on as we make our way through it. We're going to see first those invited and then those excused, and then those included, and those refused. It, it kind of rhymes, so you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Those invited, those excused, those included, and those refused. Let's first look at those invited. Jesus says to him in verse 16, here's the story. Jesus says, a man was giving a, a big dinner, and he invited many now, right off the bat, that would have made this story very, very enticing to all of these men. Remember, they live for that kind of pageantry where they could be seen, where they could be honored by others. Matthew 12 and Luke 20 tell us that they love those respectful greetings in the marketplaces. They love the chief seats in the synagogue where they could sit up front and have everybody look at them and just be in awe of them. And it says, and they love the places of honor at the banquets. They love to be seen. They love to be acknowledged by the crowd. So this would have been a, a story that really drew them in fairly quickly. They like this kind of stuff. This was their kind of event. This was... This was a priority for them in life. This is what their life, life was all about, especially when the host was very, a very prominent and wealthy man and when many were invited. And that's what's implied here in this story. This man is giving a, a big dinner, and he invited many people. And that type of banquet would have been very, very expensive. It would have taking a lot of preparation, and, and in our day, they just couldn't call in the caterers and, and have them c come in and, and, and uh, supply everything. Everything had to be made from scratch. You, you had to have a number of servants to pull something like this off. So because of the type of dinner this is and the many guests who were invited, this is obviously a wealthy, prominent man putting this thing on. It all had to be ready at the same time time so this is quite an undertaking animals had to be slaughtered and smokers and rotisseries going and bread being made and desserts being made and veggies being brought in from the garden and washed and clean and cut up and cooked and everything from scratch and, and so to help with that process they would send out an early invitation to find out who was coming and then at that hour when everything was finally ready, a servant would go to, and, and would call those who had been invited to come, and, and the feasting and the festivities would, would begin, the celebration would begin. So the first invitation was kind of like a save-the-date type of invite that we have today. The, the guests are invited, they have a date, the host knows how many to prepare for. And then verse 17 describes what happened when everything was ready at the dinner hour that at that hour when everything is ready the meats cooked the, the vegetables are done the appetizers the desserts everything the tables are set the musicians are are ready everything for this great banquet is a go that's what that's what's called here the dinner hour the dinner hour so a servant is sent out to tell those invited that it's time to come Things are ready to begin, and that's what verse 17 here is describing. The host, it says, sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. It's prepared. It, it, it's ready to be, to be eaten. The celebration is ready to begin. But now we have a problem. And this is where we move from those invited to those excused. Look at verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. It doesn't say one or two of them. It said all of them who were invited begin to make excuses. In other words, everyone who was invited originally, have, they've decided not to go at the very last minute. 
the banquet wasn't special to them anymore. They, they, they weren't interesting. Something more important had come up. Now, at this point in the story, these Pharisees and lawyers would have been thinking, that is, that is absolutely absurd. No one would do that. These banquets are such great celebrations that, that no one would bow out like that. Things like this were, were what everyone looked forward to, a, a break from the work, a, a break from the difficulty, some, some time just to rest and rejoice and to celebrate together. So to them, this story just went from entertaining to being rather preposterous. It's ludicrous to think that someone wouldn't go, especially after they had already accepted the invitation. And the more grand these banquets were, the more ridiculous it was for anyone who wouldn't go. So, so this story Jesus is telling has gone from really the absurd to the unthinkable. To not go after being invited would have been to, really, it would have been the ultimate slap in the face to the host who had invited the guest. It, it would be the ultimate act of dishonoring someone because there was tremendous investment that had gone into preparing everything. All the expense, all the preparation, all the intention, all the effort put out just, just to have his guest decline at the last minute. So this is outrageous. Why would someone even think about doing that? Well, Jesus goes on in the story to, to give three typical excuses from these no-shows. The first one, he says here, the first said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I need to go out and, and look at it. Please consider me excused. And you can see right off the, the, the bat that that's really a pretty pathetic excuse. I mean, who buys a piece of land without going and, and, and looking at it first? And it's not like it's going to change before they can get back and look at it again. So this person doesn't even come up with a good excuse. He doesn't even try. And, and that's the point here. It's weak. It's a flimsy. Verse 19. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excuse. Again, did, did you not buy them without trying them out first, without looking at them? I mean, do they all have four legs? I mean, most people who could afford to buy just five yoke of oxen all, the, all at once would be very wealthy people to begin with, and they certainly would have had servants do something like that. So again, this is a weak excuse. Then in verse 20, another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. I'm not sure I want to comment on that one. <laughs> uh, but obviously it's meant to be a flimsy, weak, silly excuse like all the others. I would assume that such a gracious host would be happy to have a, have a new wife come to the dinner with someone who had already been invited. But we also know that this would be probably the most ridiculous excuse for the Pharisees because they had a very degrading view of women. And so the idea that a woman would be the, the reason for someone to miss such a spectacular event just adds to the, just the outrageous nature of this whole story. I mean, at this point, it it'd become maybe even comical to them. It's so far-fetched. Bottom line is that all these flimsy, weak excuses were really just a sign of their complete ingratitude and their complete indifference to the, to the host. It's, it's a slap in the face. It's not the, it's, it's, it's not the wanting to honor him for his gracious invitation and expense to bring them great joy. So what's this host going to do? Well, verse 21 goes on to say, And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry. This is obviously a righteous anger. He's incensed at, after, being, after inviting these guests and, and having them turn him down, turn his lavish riches down, turn his, all that he wanted to pour upon them, his kindness to them down, that they would have decided not to come. So, there's, there's an anger going on. Uh, 
But, but all his work isn't going to go to waste. And so it says, he said to his slave, go out once into the streets and lanes of the cities and bring in here the poor and the cripple and the blind and the lame. He wants to include people now who will honor him, who will let him lavish his riches on them. So these are the included. We've seen those invited, we've seen the, those excused, and now those included. And notice he says here, go into the streets and lanes of the city, not to the houses, not to the upscale residential areas, but to the local city people who live there in the streets. And these would be not the rich, but the poor. And these wouldn't be the healthy, but the cripple and the blame and the blind and the lame. These would be the beggars who live out among the busy streets in order to beg for, for money. Remember, these are the ones who Jesus told the hosts in verse 13 that they needed to be inviting to their dinners. Those who couldn't pay you back, those who can't throw a party for you in return, invite them. And that's what this man is doing. The phrase here, bring in, bring in here, it might imply that there was some work involved in this. They, they may have been a, a little reluctant to think that they were actually worthy of such a banquet, worthy of such a dinner, worthy that they were kind of unfit, that they were socially improper. But he does it. Verse 21, 22 says, he returns and the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done. And there is still room. Every poor, every crippled, blind, and lame person I could find has been brought in, but there is still plenty of room and plenty of food to share. Verse 23, and the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. And the issue here is that the, the host has provided for so many in such a lavish way, and he isn't going to let any of it go to waste. It wasn't for nothing. He wants his entire house to be filled with people to celebrate together and to share in this banquet. He's begun filling it with the poor, the crippled, the blame, the blind, and the lame of the city, and now he's telling the servant to go into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in. This is going beyond the local city. This is going to foreigners. And all along the way, anyone who is destitute, find them and compel them to come in. The word compel here has the idea of working to get someone to do something. He's, he's going to, to people who don't live near, who, who might not even know who this man is throwing this banquet. And the servant was going to have to work harder to motivate these people to come to enjoy this dinner with someone that they didn't even know. And so this would have, have been harder work for the servant, probably needing to spend more time with the people, telling them about his master, convincing them of his goodness, convincing them of his kindness and his desire to lavish his love on those who will come, convince them that they would be welcomed in his home if they would only believe and convince that he has provided everything they would need to come and to... Be welcome there in his house. He wants his house full for this great banquet. So all those who were outcasts, who were humble, who feel unworthy, who, but who believe the servant are included. There's one last group here, though. Those who refuse. Those refused. Those who won't be welcomed at the man's dinner. We find them here in the last verse, in verse 24. But, but I want you to look at what happens here. It says in verse 24, For I tell you. Now the flow of the story up to this point, it, it, it certainly sounds like the, the, the master is still talking to the slave, doesn't it? Verse 23, if you back up just one verse, it says, And the master said to the slave, singular, slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. Verse 24, For I, the master, tell you, the slave. I mean, you could certainly read it that way in English, couldn't you? But there's a problem with that interpretation because in the Greek here, this is a plural you. Plural you. 
not singular. It would be better rendered in Texan English to say, for I tell y'all. So either the master in the story is now talking to a bunch of people, which doesn't flow with the narrative, or what has just happened here is that Jesus finished the story in verse 23 and has just turned to the larger group of these Pharisees and lawyers who had been listening in this whole time and says to all of them, for I tell you, plural, all of you at this dinner, that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. In other words, D Jesus just stepped out of the story and has applied it directly to these men listening in. The whole story was about them. They were the invited guests who didn't come. That This is where the hammer drops. That This is what they needed to understand. Going back to verse 16, that they were those invited. Remember, a man was giving a big dinner and he invited them. They were the invited many along with all of Israel. And they would have understood that from the man's statement when he made that statement before Jesus started the story, when he said, blessed is everyone who will eat in the kingdom of God. That, that, that the story that Jesus follows with here was about God giving the invitation to come and dine in his kingdom. That was very clear. And they believed that they were the privileged they were those that God would have wanted to honor at this massive banquet and glory. Certainly all Israel, but they would have seen themselves as the most honored guests. So this is God's banquet. They are those invited and they would have agreed with all of that. But the next part of the story that they probably would have seen is rather comical, but now becomes very, very offensive because those invited chose not to go. Verse 17 again, and at the dinner, that at the dinner hour he sent his slave out to say those, say to those who have been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a piece of land, I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I bought five oxen, uh, five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and for that reason I cannot come. This is not only their rejection, but Israel as a nation that they had led to reject the invitation from God's servant. It began with John the Baptist calling them to repentance and they refused to go. Jesus followed preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand to repent and they refused to go. They excused themselves from going because they were more interested in protecting their earthly property and possessions than they were in humbling themselves before him and entering God's kingdom. The dinner was ready, come, and yet they refused. The rulers called him Beelzebub, saying his miracles of kindness and compassion were from Satan. All Israel invited, and yet they turned they turned them all away. They rejected him in Galilee. They were rejecting him here in Judea. In Perea, they would reject him in Jerusalem. They didn't want to honor God or the Son of God. They were those invited, and yet were those excused from the banquet. Verse 21, And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. But those included, those included in, in, in the banquet would be the very ones that the Pharisees had rejected from their own feast. Those were the humble. Those included were the, the, the crippled. Those included were the blind and the lame. The very ones that the Pharisees rejected as sinners and regarded as sinners. Those these Pharisees didn't think were worthy of attending their dinners. Those humble Jews would be invited and welcomed at God's dinner. But they alone still weren't enough to fill up God's house to enjoy his banquet. So the church age begins. Not only are those Jews who humble themselves welcome, but the Gentiles also, the foreigners. Remember, the slave goes out beyond the city. Verse 22, and the slave said, Master, 
What you commanded has been done, and still there's room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 12, those that were separated from Christ, that is the Gentile, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Believing Jew and believing Gentile welcomed in his kingdom because servants went out and compelled them to come in by describing a God who so loved the world that he sent his only son to go and to die on their behalf to pay for their sin for them. And in that they see the love of God demonstrated toward them and that while they were yet sinners, Christ died for them. The servants compelled the Gentiles to come in. Those included would be all who would humble themselves and believe the gospel and see God's abundant provision in Christ, turning from their sin and receiving him as their Lord and Savior. They are welcomed. All those who the Pharisees had rejected in their banquets, the Gentile and the suffering Jew, would be welcomed at God's banquet. And yet they would be those refused. Remember back in chapter 13 and verse 25 of Luke, Jesus tells a story about those who were invited and came to the door and began to stand outside and knock, saying, Lord, open up to us. And the answer was, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. He goes on to say that in that place, in that place where they will be outside of his house, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from the east and they will come from the west and they'll come from the north and they'll come from the south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. The Pharisees would be refused. The unbelieving Jew would be refused. The unbelieving Gentile would be refused because they didn't repent, because they didn't humble themselves, because they didn't believe on Christ Jesus. So Jesus says, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. When God is lavishing upon his people at his banquet, all of his goodness and all of his riches and glory, his love, when, when we are basking in the wonder of joy of who he is and what he has done on our behalf, when we are honoring him and celebrating him full of joy for all eternity, those who have refused the gospel refused him as their Lord and Savior, refused to repent, refused to count him as worthy of their worship. He will refuse them, and they will not be there. The question is, will you be dining in the kingdom? This is a profound warning that unless you accept God's invitation to come through Christ, you won't be. And the excuses to not come now will seem very foolish, will seem very preposterous, ludicrous. They will seem absurd on that day when you realize you aren't welcomed. Our God is holy, our God is just, our God is righteous, and his demands are sinless perfection. And we, from that, we all understand very clearly that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory, fallen short of that standard. Yet Christ has given himself to satisfy God's justice for you, that you may be forgiven, that his righteousness might be imputed to you so that you can be welcomed at his banquet and celebrate him, honoring him for all eternity. That is God's invitation. Honor the son who lived, died, died. 
and was raised from the dead for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage this morning. It reminds us so much of the reality of our salvation. That it is what Christ is. It is who he is. It is what he has accomplished on our behalf. It cannot be by works which we have done, for we have none. But on his works. And so we thank you that we can have such the great hope of such a great banquet, of such a great joy and celebration of our Christ when we leave this world and we go to be with him. Father, I pray that if anyone has heard this that doesn't know you, that you would be gracious through your spirit and your word to convict them of their sin and need for a Savior and that they, they would turn confessing themselves as a sinner and looking to Christ as their Savior, as their Lord, and following him. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.